I'd like to welcome you to the first presentation of the year for the Associate Student Speakers Program. Every week, we be providing you with the finest in personalities who embrace the best of politics, entertainment, and the arts. Next Tuesday, we'll be having activist Julian Bond at the bottom of Jan Steps, and that will begin at 12 noon. Now I'd like to introduce to you Adam Fierro, who makes some brief comments about today's very special guest. Okay, before we begin, I'd like to just tell you that the mics for questioning Mr. Perlman are on either side of the room, and you can line up behind them. Our guest was born in Israel in 1945. He has trained at the Academy of Music in Tel Aviv and the Juilliard School in New York. Since his initial appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show at the age of 13, he has gone on to receive numerous Grammy Awards, has played with every major orchestra in the world, and in 1981 was selected as Musician of the Year. In everything he does, our guest displays not only the qualities that make him an outstanding musician, but also a great man. A victim of infantile paralysis at the age of four, he now champions the cause of the handicapped and the disabled, his devotion to it an integral part of his life. Please welcome the greatest violinist in the world, Mr. Itzhak Perlman. Now, what do, what do people, uh, thank you very much for this undeserved introduction. Where is he? Oh, he's left already. Uh, I, don't, I don't usually know what uh, people in this uncomfortable situation do. Oh, close that. But I'm, I do not intend to make any speeches or anything like this. I, I wanted to, to uh, actually present a lecture on what makes cornstarch important in Chinese food, <laughs> but, but I felt that it would be too boring for you, and uh, I could then compare it to, you know, how important vibrato is for a string instrument. But uh, I'm not going to ask, uh, I'm not going to, you know, bore you with all of that. I just uh, hope that um, somebody will have the, uh, the Courage? No, you don't need courage here. Just, just keep asking me questions because that's basically what I'm here for, is to answer anything you'd like to know. Well, almost anything. So uh, if there are any questions from the audience, I will try and uh, respond. And I don't see anybody. Can we have a little light in there? I mean, because this sounds too much like a performance. <laughs> I'm not going to perform anything. So uh, we have a little bit so I can see what... Anyway, so if anybody would like to ask anything, I'm, I'm, I'll be most uh, willing to, to answer. And please and ask your questions from the microphones on the sides of the ballroom as well. Okay. I will, uh, if, if in 10 seconds I don't hear any questions, I'm going to lunch. No, kidding. Okay, I'd like to. I um, have a question. Thank you. As far as the, uh, as new music comes in, um, what in the solo repertoire. What is your opinion of the, the new works that are being composed, um, the, the contemporary? Well, I'll tell you, I can't make general. I, I, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's unfair for me to make a general statement of what I think about contemporary music. I'm sure that um, uh, there are many uh, wonderful pieces being written today. And I'm sure there are many less than wonderful pieces b being written today. I'm, I'm getting um, a lot of tapes and uh, a lot of cassettes. Uh, you know, I have, I don't know, I don't know how many cassettes with, with new pieces and, and, and so on and so forth. And uh, it's a very slow sort of process to listen to everything. Um, but, uh, you know, there's some good stuff. As a matter of fact, right now I'm working on a piece that was written for me, which I'm going to premiere in a couple of months in New York. Um, 
It's by um, a composer called Earl Kim, who is uh, who's a music professor in Harvard, and it's a it's a fairly good piece. I like it. It's very difficult, you know. I think he's a sadist by nature, <laughs> and um, you know, it's it's a it's a real uh, it it uh, you know it's a, it's a handbreaker, but it's a good piece. So I'm going to play it. By the way, how many uh, how many people here are associated with music? Can they raise? Them? Oh, thank God! Oh, I thought it was good, <laughs> terrific. Okay, so uh, you know, I mean, there's it's it's uh, it's no different than than hundred years ago. I mean, there's new stuff being written. There's all oh, there's bad there's good stuff and bad stuff. You know, it depends. You have to find the good stuff. I'll do the second question oh, yeah. here, oh. this side. Oh, okay. I I knew that your uh, uh, appearance here will have such a great. Uh, uh, respond that I just brought my will, my chair with me to be sure that I'm getting a chair. And look what you're getting, a full audience. All the chairs I've been taking, so it's good that I brought my chair. Now, uh, I, changed, I, think so. <laughs> I changed the subject. I'm going to change the subject, and I think uh, we'll take turns. Some of us will ask about uh, what is visible, and some of us will ask about others, so it will be variety. If you don't mind. I don't mind at all. You okay, fine. Uh, the first thing I'd like to ask you about, uh, how do you perceive or how do you uh, uh, think that we can uh, change uh, attitude and uh, awareness toward uh, people with disabilities? First of all, for example, uh, we communicate through words and we call uh, uh, People with uh, disabilities, we call them handicapped. And uh, the idea behind the handicap is the person standing in the corner holding a, hand, a cap in his uh, hand and collecting money. And we are not handicapped. We are people with disabilities. So please, if you can respond to uh, uh, issues of this. We are, uh, first of all, Everybody has disabilities. Nobody's uh, unlimited uh, abilities is unlimited. Listen, so ours far I is, agree with everything you said. So let's. ours is is uh, uh, is visible, but uh, we are uh, disabled only very small part of the time. And you are a living example of what uh, a person with a small disability can do. So when we are parents, we're loving and we're doing uh, as good job as, as an able person. And when we are doing uh, an office work or something that takes uh, sitting, we are doing as good job as everybody else. So when I'm analyzing, I'm a literature student, I'm not a music student, but when I'm analyzing a poem or a book, I'm doing as well as uh, and sensitive and good work as anybody else. So please address to those and call the attention to the uh, able body quote, uh, what is disability and what is our ability? Well, I'll tell you, so far, you've said it all. No. <laughs> In other words, I, you know, I agree with what you, with, with what you no. the thing is, what, what would you... <laughs> What would you like me to respond to? I mean, w uh, the thing is that I agree with what you said. I think that uh, attitudes uh, towards disabled people in the United States um, are far from perfect. Uh, I think that we have a very, very long way to go. I feel that uh, it is very important to, um, to uh, shape these attitudes in this level, in, in school level, because I feel that uh, sometimes, uh, you know, I've been, for example, take a very small uh, situation uh, as, as far as I'm concerned in the general picture, which is accessibility, which is something that I'm very, very much concerned with. As by the way, I've seen a lot of signs uh, uh, in this campus that, uh, that prove that, you know, that things are being done, which, which is very, very, which is terrific. I think it's great. But uh, the thing is that I feel that, uh, for example, when I play concerts and I go to um, uh, new concert halls or, or old concert halls, I always find that a lack of knowledge, particularly <coughs> in, the, um, in the field of architecture, is a very severe problem because uh, architects are just not aware of what makes 
a place accessible. And <clears throat> I've said it many, many times. I am one of the great experts in garbage elevators because that's all you have. To, you know, I, I, uh, you know, I don't go in the front. You know, they said, oh, Mr. Perlman, oh, well, yes, uh, over there. You know, and I usually go in huge, enormous freight elevators, and they go about uh, two inches an hour and so on. And uh, it's a real problem. And the thing is that right now, uh, I don't know if all, of, all of you are aware of, of the regulations, which are 504 regulations, which means that every place has to be accessible, et cetera, et cetera, and when it's provided with federal funds. Even the federal funds that are provided to concert halls and so on, even with all of that, you still find that people didn't quite think about what's going on as far as making, they thought that maybe the front should be accessible, but the back is not. And, you know, I'm a back person when it comes to concert halls. You know, that's where, where I come from. I'm not going to come from the front. So they said, oh, we didn't know that, uh, oh, that's right. The back is supposed to be accessible as well as the front and so on. So there's a lot of education still to be done, and I always am wondering, whether architects have to take a course in barrier-free design, which there's no such program, I, I, unless, you know, somebody here can say to me, gee, we have such a program, but I'm sure you don't, for architects to, to really take six months or a year and, and have uh, a course in barrier-free design just to know what's going on, because people don't do that on purpose, put steps in, in our way. You know, they do it because they don't think about it, and steps are always much, you know, much nicer to go, you know, you see a, a flight of stairs in the front of a of a building, you know, and it's much more uh, 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 impressive. So, you know, so I, I find that uh, the problem is just, just keep constantly talking about it. I realize this is not one of our most popular subjects to talk about. I, I definitely know that. I know that politicians are not too um, uh, crazy about it either. But, you know, we have to face it because we're talking about an enormous minority in the United States. So I, I feel that talking about it and writing letters and being and voicing your opinion is is you just keep doing it. And the thing is, it's not going to get accomplished overnight. But to be discouraged is wrong, be, even even though you don't see the proper results. I happen to live in New York City, which is one of the worst places when it comes to to accessibility for the disabled. Terrible, you know. I I once tried, you know, they used to have a UJA appeal walkathon. You know, the, the more you walk, the more money you raise. It's a terrific idea. And I try, you know, of course, I put myself in a wheelchair and I try to, to walk a thon around the city. Oh, well, that, uh, you know, when you, when you see a curb cut, you know, and you go down the curb cut and on the other side of the street there's no curb cut. <laughs> so you're stuck in the middle of the street. What do I do now? <laughs> so then you make a right turn into the dog do and then... <laughs> and then the left turn into the, into the cobblestones that weren't there, and then so you had to get out of the chair and put yourself back in the chair and so on. So it's a very, it's a very difficult problem, and um, I've been in touch with everybody, and uh, I'm just doing whatever I can. I, I'm, I, when I first was aware of this thing several years back, I was made aware, more aware than, than ever before. I thought I was going to take on the whole world, but uh, now I know better. I just know that I can do everything that I can possibly do on my own and uh, you know whatever little help I can do is is, is uh, I feel important so uh, anyway that's the situation anybody yes I was wondering what you thought of the Suzuki program and whether or not you felt it could be a disadvantage for a young musician to learn to read music at a after he's been studying for several years All right, I'm gonna get killed for this I know every time I, I'm being asked for a, Suzuki, a question about what I think of Suzuki, I get killed because I always get letter. How dare you say that? You don't know what you're talking about. Well, I'll tell you. I believe in the Suzuki method. Uh, I believe that um, uh, the earlier you learn to read music, the better it is. I mean, that's my own belief. You know, that's uh, now I know that uh, there. I've grown to to realize that there are certain. Um, um, different variations of Suzuki methods and, and some people tell me that they, they teach at an early age to read as well you know I don't know if that's true or not but I like to see people uh, learn to read music as soon as possible um, a method and there's no method that is uh, the, the Suzuki method is very good but you need uh, good teachers in other words good if, if you have a really terrific teachers it works and uh, it's certainly but uh, I'm not going to um, I'm not that familiar with the method, but I'm not going to personally recommend somebody to, to, uh, to uh, be in that method if, if that particular person is extremely, extremely talented. You know, 
I somehow would like to feel more of a, you know, a one-on-one -on -one, uh, uh, teaching situation. But uh, I've, I've seen a lot of people in, uh, in the Suzuki Method all across the United States, and, and you know, they seem to be very, very happy, and, uh, and they do some very nice things. But I, I believe that the sooner you learn how to read, the better it is. It's my, my... Thank you. Yes. Okay, over in your left. Yes. Yeah, I've been playing violin since I guess I was about 10, and as I played more and more, I found that I acquired a rash on the left side of my neck. And I was wondering if you'd encountered this problem, and have you found an antidote, or am I doomed? For, doomed a problem for a rash on the forever? neck. <clears throat> Any medical students here? <laughs> well, is it a rash or is it a real bump? Well, um, I went to the doctor, and he said it was like some sort of cyst from irritation. He thought it was the wood on the yeah. you chin. Press, you, 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 you're pressing too hard. Okay. Right? Are you, you're holding violin like dear life, right? Yeah, well, I've tried all sorts of neck positions, and it That's doesn't right. seem you're, to do anything. You're, you know, really, look, I got a little mark here, you know. Uh, Can we have some more light here? No, anyway. <laughs> um, I got a little mark here, but it's how many hours a day do you practice? Well, not that much now, but I was practicing a couple hours a day for a while. Yeah, but look, then if you were only practing a couple of hours a day, you must have been pressing like mad. <laughs> so just, just, you know, look, just, just, it's, it's a basically a, a problem of, you know, just try and hold the violin firmly, you know, but just realize that it's not a sponge. You know, the more you press, nothing will happen. It's just going to ruin your neck. That's what it's going to do. And, and your problem is not uncommon, so that you, you can... You know, it's not uncommon. So just don't press his heart, okay. and uh, it'll go away in a couple of years. <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, many people, many people, uh, people tell others when you play music, you should put your soul into it. If or not, you're not going to play good music. Mm. Now I'd like to ask you, what kind of emotions do you feel when you play a piece, in a concert hall or in practice? How you feel when you play that? Well, if I'm hungry, I, I think about... <laughs> no, uh, well, I mean, uh, on the, you know, I understand you, you understand or not? Yeah, you, yes, yes, yes. Yes, okay. Yes, How do you feel when you play, or perhaps it's, you play so much it's indifferent, or again, you feel emotional when you play a piece? Well, I tell you, uh, it, the, for me, the, the, the job of a performer is to, to communicate with an audience, right? and to try and, and, and give yourself as much as yourself as possible into the piece, but obviously to do justice to what the composer has written. And this is a combination. And <clears throat> you, in a sense, I suppose, when you perform in front of an audience, you, you bear part of your, yourself. You know, you, you have to do that. In other words, you cannot, you cannot be uh, shy about it or, or, or subtle about it, you know, you've got to really express what comes out, you know, and, and that's what ba would basically have to convince the audience of what you're doing. It's, it's basically that's what it is, you know. Obviously, um, <clears throat> everybody has a different way of communicating. Sometimes you see people on stage that, that you play and you say to yourself, well, gee, they're, they're playing for themselves. It's a very inner kind of, of, of playing. I, with me, it's the country. I just like to just let me show you what I think about that piece, you know. And that's basically what what I try to do, um, as far as playing with soul or with heart or whatever it is. That's a, that's a uh, it's a matter of semantics. I think it's it's uh, you know. I mean, somebody else can express it in a different way, but it's just trying very hard to to really uh, communicate what you're trying to do. And, and, to, and hopefully that what you're communicating is what really, what you're trying to communicate is coming out of the, of the instrument, you see? And uh, sometimes, you know, you want to communicate very well, but somehow it doesn't translate itself. And so I, I hope I'm, I'm doing a halfway decent job, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. There. You're performing Berg's uh, magnificent concerto this week with the Philharmonic. Yes. There's an especially dramatic passage in it, in the second movement, where the, the soloist is directed by Berg to, um, with a gesture, lead the first violins into um, a unison melody. Right. Do you, do you perform this with Giulini in that way? And also, do you, can, do you include his chamber concerto and Schoenberg's um, great concerto in your repertory? 
Okay. Um, as far as the Schoenberg concerto, I haven't gotten to it yet. And I'm being pushed very, very hard by everybody around me to try and tackle it. I would rather think you were being pulled by its great beauty. Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> well, so far I haven't been pulled by its beauty since I'm not familiar with the piece. I haven't really, so that I'm... Uh, uh, but I will probably get to it one of these days. As far as leading the uh, violins, I do, you know, I just give that uh, thing. With, with, it's, it's, I have a feeling that this is almost like a, uh, uh, something that uh, you, uh, the composer indicated from a, almost from a chamber music point of view. And not, it's not absolutely necessary. I do it in any case. Um, uh, so, uh, and... Uh, I don't, I don't understand. There was another question that you asked. There was something else that you well, asked. Uh, if you also include his chamber concerto. No, in your repertoire. no, I haven't yet. I haven't yet, but I'm, I'm going to get to it. Oh. Believe me, I'm going to get to it. Given the great changes in rock music now, do you see any of that reflected in the classical compositions that are coming your way? Well, um, not, not so much my way. I've, I, I know that there is, uh, there has been a, a very serious try to integrate uh, a lot of um, uh, jazz idioms or rock idioms. As a matter of fact, I've been approached by uh, by uh, a very, a very interesting record company to uh, to do a uh, recording with with the Rolling Stones. <laughs> Uh, or with Pete Townsend, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Who? Uh, anyway. And, and uh, I, 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 so far, maybe one of these days, I, you know, if I have a couple of drinks, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll try to, to see what happens. You know, they were very serious about this, you know, to really try for an integrating thing. But I'm, I'm, maybe I'm, uh, I'm yet to, uh, you know, I'm not sure. I've done stuff with jazz. And, and I felt very comfortable. So far, I, I'm not feeling too comfortable with, uh, with uh, mixing those idioms uh, uh, because, well, I've, I've been listening to a lot. You know, my 13-year-old son uh, listens to a lot of that stuff, you know. And uh, <laughs> as a matter of fact, I tried to blackmail him into listening to classical music, and he sort of, we have two stations going on in the, in the car radio, and every time we hear some, you know, I pushed one station, he says, ah, Mozart, and I said... Ah, Chicago. <laughs> so so uh, he says, can you imagine Chicago? It's the first hit they've had in seven years, Chicago. You know that hit, Chicago? What? Well, whatever it is, anyway. Uh, so uh, I don't know. Maybe one of these days it'll happen. But I don't want to force the issue. You know, I, I know that a lot of, of, of people try to force the issue of really mixing the stuff. But for me, it's very important if it works. You know, if it doesn't work, it's, it's, it's silly to do it. You know? Yes, Mr. Perlman. Yes. I'm, I'm a violinist also, and I've admired you and your mentor, Isaac Stern, for many years. Um, also, uh, concerning Mr. Stern, though, he has been renowned not only as a violinist, but as also somewhat of a diplomat in uh, certain social causes. And I'm curious as to whether you plan to carry on that tradition in some extent, uh, maybe under his influence. Well, um, next question. <laughs> Well, I tell you, uh, the only thing that I've been doing, uh, you know, well, obviously, you know, he has different interests than I do. His interest uh, uh, lies with a lot with young people. Not that my interest doesn't, but I feel that the uh, that the problems that uh, disabled people are having in the, in the United States have really taken all of my other time, you know, besides music, and that's basically what I try to do all the time. Uh, and uh, it's uh, so that's I, I do not uh, believe me I'm not going to enter politics and although some people suggested that I should run for something you know as so I said to him you know I can't run maybe I can walk for something <laughs> but uh, you know I that's basically the, the most important thing that I do besides playing music Hi. Yes. Um, I heard you earlier talking about communication and being a violinist, you, you have to um, have accompanist sometimes. So I was just wondering, what do you look for in accompanist, and how do you work together to achieve the music you both want? Well, uh, uh, in accompanist, first of all, you look to somebody who can really have a terrific sense of humor so that you don't get bored when you travel. And, uh, 
No, actually, you look, to, you look for somebody who really plays the instrument very well, who really can uh, do your, you know, who you can really communicate with and, and, and uh, is good enough to, to uh, you know, because after all, you know, violin, fiddle players are just very, un, um, this is an unfortunate uh, thing about uh, uh, instrumentalists uh, uh, who are not pianists. Because, uh, you know, pianists, you can just go on tour forever and ever and not need anybody. You just play your own instrument. You, you know, you've got two hands and you've got the complete works. But we have to have in association with, you know, with orchestras and, of course, with pianists and, and with an accompanying, uh, uh, well, with the pianist, you know, it's no longer accompanying. It's really, uh, you know, you collaborate together. So you look, you know, you look for a wonderful musician. That's, that's very, very important. It's, uh, it's always been. And I have a couple of people that I play with. <laughs> that I like very, very much and uh, that I'm very happy with. And it's, it's very important to like them as people? Oh, yes. I mean, you've, you know, you work with it. <laughs> it was a, sounds like a leading question. No, uh, no. You, <laughs> no, you, yes. Oh, absolutely. You know, you have to have somebody that, that you can work with, that you can communicate with, with. Obviously, I'm not saying it's more important than the musical ability, but sure. you've got to have both. Otherwise, it just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work. Yes. Oh, what specific techniques do you use to uh, help cure the anxiety of having a memory lapse during performance? And mm -hmm. uh, do you approach learning something like the Berg Violin Concerto differently than, say, something more familiar to the, air, the ear like the Bach or Beethoven? Well, uh, when it comes to memory, uh, all I can say is just don't worry about it. <laughs> that, <laughs> well, I mean, basically, in, in, in regular repertoire, you know, if, uh, you know, sometimes in, in pieces like the Berg Concerto, uh, the, if I start to worry about it, I, I'd rather just use the music and, and not bother. But the, there's, it's, it, there is a, there's uh, basically just repeating things, I find, is very, very, uh, is very helpful, particularly in, in, uh, in, um, standard repertoire, uh, knowing the uh, harmonic progressions and, and figuring out in certain difficult spots uh, that, that usually you have memory uh, slips with or something like this is also, in other words, to give yourself hints, I know that this is going to go wrong, and then um, figuring out, let's say, how many bars this is, you know, what is the harmonic progression and so on and so forth, that's very helpful. But I think that if, if you try real hard, you can have a memory slip in, an, in a G major scale. You know, in other words, if you try very, very hard to do it. In other words, if you, if you have a complex about it. So the thing to do is just, if you know that you remember everything, is just not to worry about it. Do, do you play the violin? Yes. I see. And, and you, do you find that that's a big problem? Or, uh, not a big one, but often in rehearsal, you will not think about it, and you go to performance and you start to be conscious of things exactly. you never before, and so that everything just starts to... Right. In other words, in rehearsal, when you don't think about it, there's no problem. Right. You just go right through, and then in performance, you say, what is the next note? What is the next pass? Well, don't ask words? that. Don't say that. <laughs> think about a nice pizza or something. I mean, <laughs> you know, you think about, I'm not just going to play. You know, I know, and especially you think about, right, you play one movement, and you think... Hey, how does a third movement start? Yeah. Right? All of a sudden, you don't know what the third movement's. But, but usually, you find out that when, when you reach the end of this movement, you already have the sound of the second movement and the third movement. I, I sometimes have a, a tendency to do this. And then I just, um, you know, there was a couple of times in which I was playing a concerto in which I found myself starting a movement. I never forget, I did a Stravinsky concerto. I started the third movement. And all of a sudden, two minutes later, I was at the end. <laughs> and and I didn't know I was at the end until the conductor who was conducting was going <clears throat> <clears throat> and I said what is he clearing his throat for you know I looked and he said like that and so I realized and boy you should have you should have heard me compose on the spot <laughs> it was I was I was great you know I mean, it was <laughs> I was I, I did Stravinsky uh, until until the the blessed cadence arrived and you know, but it was, it was, I think, about 12 seconds. It seemed like 12 years. But, uh, you know, it does happen once in a while. But I'll never forget that spot, believe me. <laughs> you just took the uh, BA off the ABA form, 
So you ended up with an I a. just, I just, yeah, I just took the, you know, I just skipped the B. <laughs> but anyway, I, I got out of it. I just, I just, you know, in other words, I realized what was coming, and uh, and uh, I just uh, uh, made it up as I went along for a couple of lines until the cadence came, and then I continued. And to my other question, did you approach the learning of the Berg differently than the Bach? Than the what? Then say the Bach violin concerto or the Beethoven no, or any other. No, no, you don't. I mean, it's it's much. You know, it's not as 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 uh, as, as tonal, obviously. But but you know, you study the score, you study the the music, and and you you know, you try to analyze certain things. You know, it's it's basically the same thing. It it might be a bit more difficult, but I'm sure that there are people who are much more at home. Uh, you know, if they devote a lot of time to 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 basically atonal music, but Berg is really not quite atonal, you know, it's quite, you know, you can find tonality in it if you really half try. Yes? You've mentioned uh, experimenting with jazz. Do you have any affinity or association with more traditional forms of fiddling? Uh, do you ever sit and fiddle around? <laughs> <laughs> you mean old time country fiddling oh, oh, and traditional like that. fiddling? Yeah, yeah, a little bit. You know, I mean, just just before a concert. <laughs> do you find I do started off as a violinist? Yes. For ten or twelve years, and took up fiddling a very short time ago, and find the transition extremely difficult. Why? Technically? Yes. Yeah, you mean you're playing too straight? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I was speaking with uh, I was speaking with Jean-Luc Ponty, who is uh, I don't know if you know he's jazz. He plays a lot of jazz, and he and he was also trained classically. And he said that it took him a long time to untrain himself. That's In other what words, I keep being told. To to you know to get a lousy bow, so that you can have that you know, yeah. But I think that what what you basically have to do is to listen a lot. You know, listen like mad to to a lot of uh, you know. A different bluegrass, whatever you know, whatever you know, whatever interests you. You know, I I uh, I found it the same in jazz. Is that uh, uh, you know, I I know in my mind what I want it to sound like, but somehow the hands go too straight. You know, they're too well trained, and 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 that you can't do anything. And you know, like this, you spill the water, you know, everything. <laughs> so you just you know, it's a question of practice. It's it's the same thing. You know, either you want to call it practice or unpractice. But uh, you know, the more the more you listen to the stuff, the more familiar it gets, and then somehow it communicates. Just but lighten the, up, huh? Pardon? Just lighten up, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. I have two questions for you. Yes. First of all, could you tell us about the um, the extent of your your repertoire, concerto and sonata, both the size and the breadth? And the second question is, could you talk about the um, the special kind of chemistry and working relationship you seem to enjoy with Pincus Uckerman? How much you play in the course of a year together and whether you plan to expand your um, concert schedule with him. That's, in that's two questions. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, wait a minute. I forgot what the first was. The uh, repertoire. The first was what? Repertoire. <laughs> repertoire. Well, uh, you know, I, I, I know most, mo mostly the, the, the major uh, concertos. I have about between 10 and 15 concertos. You know, I mean, the fiddle players don't have that many concertos. I mean, obviously, trumpet players have, have even less. And uh, flute players, and harp players, and tuba players, and <laughs> and timpani players. You know, I mean, uh, just because everybody who uh, you know, when, whenever I complain about not having enough repertoire, you know, people approach me and says, "You you think you don't have enough repertoire? Look at us!" You know, and so on. But uh, I have that, and and you know, and I I know most of the uh, standard sonata repertoire and so on. So I don't have any problem. I still look. You know, I still for me to make up a recital program is like to give birth, you know, it's, it's, it's a very, it's a major thing, you know, what, what am I going to play this year that I didn't play two hours ago? <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it's very difficult, but, uh, you know, I do, I do the best, I have no problem with that. Uh, you know, I play about three or four recital programs a year now, you know, different recital programs, and so on. Uh, as far as uh, working with uh, Pinka Zuckerman, we haven't done... Uh, Anything together in the, in uh, in a year already, you know. We, 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 we don't have really a, a a plan, you know. We get in touch with each other, and sometimes we do something. I'm going to uh, I'm going to Israel in a couple of months now, and I'm going to play with him the contretemps 
again. And we just have a nice time together because, you know, we wouldn't be brought up in Israel and uh, we've known each other since uh, uh, early teenagehood and, uh, and uh, we, we communicate musically. We don't have uh, so many different opinions so that we, we have a nice time together. Just a personal note is that of the dozen or so times I've heard you, my, my favorite performance of yours was a recital with him in New York because you seem to have so much fun with him on stage, and it's fun for the audience to see Well, we, we, we do that, you know, and uh, after a while when you play together and you know exactly what the other person is going to do without actually talking about it to begin with, then that's a lot of fun. So we do that. Yes. Yes. One more. Oh, we have time for one more question. So that I was told, you know, it's not my fault, you know, ask me. Please. I have two parts, though. Is that okay? Two parts to one question. I'll make it three parts to one question. Yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, most of the renowned musicians these days have won, like, a major competition in their life. Do you think it's necessary for the younger people to win something major in order to succeed? Mm -hmm. And another question is that, um, do you think it's necessary to have, like, a name behind you, like, say you graduate from Julia versus UCLA? In order <laughs> well, as a music major, I'm saying. As a music major. Right. Okay. Uh, if your first question about competitions, um, it is, if you win a competition, it puts you immediately in the limelight in a certain degree, you know. It doesn't guarantee that you're going you're gonna to do it. You know, in other words, you can do it without, without a competition, but it's easier to do it with. It's also easier not to do it with a competition. In other words, competition, um, uh, but, well, it depends what. You know, if you're talking about a huge competition in which one, one year, you know, you, you have no concerts and the next year you got 50 concerts, you know, that's like jumping into an ice-cold swimming pool. You know, you, you, it's very, very difficult to get used to it right away. And so, so a lot of people sometimes just have that, you know, real low after a competition that, and, and they can't get out of it. And so that, in a sense, it's much, it's much better to do something gradual. When I won, a, I won the Eleven Street competition after, and that's the way basically it gave me a start. But with me, the first year I had about 13 concerts, 14 concerts, and the next year I had 20 concerts, and the next year I had 30 concerts. It was a gradual thing. So with me it was, uh, you know, I didn't have this incredible uh, uh, just uh, uh, a whole bunch of concerts that I couldn't handle. As, as a, you know, coming in from being a student and so on. And the, the, what was the other question? Um, famous schools. Oh, about yeah. famous schools. Well, uh, Juilliard is not exactly, uh, Juilliard is, is, is of, of course, is a very good name to have, you know, obviously. You know, if you're very serious about it and, and somebody says, I'm a Juilliard graduate, you know, people always, oh, very nice, you know, a Juilliard graduate, you know. And uh, if they say, I'm a string player and I'm a graduate of UCLA, they said, oh, what kind of a tennis game do you play? <laughs> you know, in a, <laughs> a string player? Uh, string, uh. Anyway, but, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, you know it, it really is, this is basically, you know, people always radiate. You know, obviously there are certain schools that, that are known for the music departments in, in, the, in the country. You're talking about, you know, Indiana and in Bloomington and uh, Oberlin and Eastman School and Juliet Curtis and so on and so forth and so on. So obviously, you know, if, if you want a good music, uh, if you're very, very serious about music pro pro program, I'm not familiar what the program is here, but, uh, you know, the, the, the person, you know, the, the names that are known in the country are what the names that I mentioned, and that's what usually people tend to radiate towards and so on. So uh, obviously this is, this is a very important thing if you're graduate of one of these schools. Anyway, I'm sorry that we can't talk anymore. I'm, somebody is pushing me out of here. But uh, I'd like to thank you very, very much for being a good audience. I would like to again thank Mr. Perlman very, very much for lending us part of his afternoon and also thank Hillel for all their involvement in making his appearance possible. Thank you.